All right. Hello and welcome to Timmeton radio station in Sweden. My name is Fredrik Wiklund and I will be your host today. I'm also chairman of the Alexander Association, uh, a group of volunteers working with this uh, fantastic uh, radio transmitter from early 1920s. Uh, next to me I have my team members, uh, starting with Kai, uh, who will be our telegraphist today. He will be transmitting the message. Uh, on my right hand side I have Jon Åke, who will be the main operator uh, together with me. And uh, to my left side uh, we have Anders, who will be our assistant. Uh, behind the camera we have Thomas, and uh, down by the uh, Video and audio mixer, we have Janne, who is making sure you can hear and see us. This radio station was uh, made, a political decision was made about this uh, radio station in 1920. Uh, due to lack of finance and uh, other problems, the decision wasn't made until 1922. Uh, in November, early November, 1922, uh, the first work was done on this radio station, just over a hundred years ago. Fantastic. Um, in 1924, the radio station was completed, and in October of uh, 1924, our Alexanderson alternator was in the air for the first time, and it was put into commercial operation on December 1st, 1924. Uh, this is the one only Alexanderson, or the one and only mechanical radio transmitter from, from this area that is still uh, uh, available and functioning. Um, in 1995, uh, the owner of this facility, the Swedish Telecom, um, didn't see any need for this equipment anymore and decided to try to sell it or, or scrap it. And our association uh, was founded in 1996 and we immediately started to work on uh, a building protection that happened the same year and the year after, in 1997, um, we were listed as an industrial uh, cultural uh, heritage. And then the, the work began to uh, get this listed as a world heritage. And on July 7, 2004, this site was listed as a world heritage, one of 15 world heritages in Sweden. Um, today, on November 16, we are celebrating uh, the, 50, the 50th anniversary of uh, UNESCO uh, Convention for the Protection of the World Cultural and Natural Heritage. Uh, and we feel very proud to be part of this. And we will be trying to start up the transmitter and send out a message, uh, a peace message, uh, to the whole world. This uh, fantastic transmitter that you can see behind us is, um, uh, has a, the heart of the transmitter here is, is the Alexanderson alternator. And uh, the alternator is a mechanical device to produce a radio wave. And it's operated by a huge 500 horsepower electrical motor. Uh, via uh, a gearbox and to the uh, alternator itself. Uh, to my right here we have uh, a set of auxiliary equipment, we have a relay corridor and you can also see the operator panel where we will be operating um, the transmitter. And in the very far corner we have the uh, magnetic amplifier where the radio wave is being chopped up in, in dots and dashes in Morse code and it's being sent out to the antenna through those two copper wires. You can see there are copper pipes. Uh, in order to get this transmitter up and running we have to do some preparations and we have been uh, checking that we have enough lubrication in all bearings 
there are no ball bearings anywhere in this transmitter. All bearings, the kilovolt is then transformed down to 2300 volt, which is the operating voltage here, uh, two phase, which is very unusual. Uh, not three-phase. The reason for two-phase uh, most likely is that this machine was developed in 1910s, between 1915 and 1917 uh, and in America and the most common power grid system in America at that time was two-phase. So we, we are receiving 2300 volt two-phase into the building and by that I think we are ready to try to get started. So I will ask Jan Åke to uh, go down to the uh, emergency switch and I will move to the main power switch. And I have eye contact with Jan Åke and I will turn on the main power. Like that. And now you can hear we have uh, an alarm. And the alarm is, is telling us that we are lacking oil pressure and we are lacking water pressure. And we will begin by uh, turning on the water cooling pump. We have two cooling pumps or circulation pumps, one and two. We will be running pump number one today. Um, and this is all about redundancy. If pump number one would fail, we can always immediately switch over to pump number two. So Janoki will begin by opening up a bleed valve and then the water supply uh, to fill up the house of this centrifugal pump. And we can hear and see that air is coming out mixed with water. And when we have just water coming out now, we can turn off the bleeder valve. And then Jon Åke will go down and turn on the pump. And it's a star and delta starter. Not to have a, a too high starting uh, amperage. And then Jon Åke will begin to open up the valve to the circulation system. It's one of the heaviest jobs today, physically heavy. It's about 25 turns. And as he is opening up the valve, we can watch the gauge on the wall and see that the pressure will slowly go up to about 2 bar or 30 psi which is the nominal pressure in the circulation system. The water cooling circulation system is, is rather big and complex. We have uh, two outdoor uh, water tanks supplying, uh, one of the tanks is supplying this pump with cooling water. The cooling water then is circulated through, uh, first of all, two uh, water-filled liquid resistors. The liquid resistors we will talk about a little bit later. And then the water circulation continues down to the alternator. Uh, and down to the high frequency amplifier and then back again. We will check that we have enough water level in uh, the liquid resistor and we check the other one and it's, uh, it looks okay. The liquid resistors uh, are directly connected, one of them is directly connected to the rotor of the main drive motor and we can adjust the rotor resistance uh, more or less uh, stepless using this uh, device and by that we can control the power to the motor. The next step would be for Jan Åke to 
put on the protection gloves and he will then uh, manually turn on the water circulation pumps in each one in each one of the liquid resistors that was the first resistor the starting resistor and then we have the compensation resistor and uh, now we can hear that the water is flushing in the two liquid resistors we will move back to the control panel and the Anoki will turn on the alarm bell again and uh, now we have to make sure we have enough oil pressure the uh, bearings to the alternator uh, needs oil pressure so we have an auxiliary oil pump that the Anoki now is turning on and we can hear that the alarm goes off So the next step would be to turn on the main drive motor and again Jan Åke will walk down to the emergency stop. And now we can see that the motor slowly is starting to rotate. Uh, at this moment we are uh, ha we are supplying about 150 amps to the motor or even a little bit more the voltage is around 1200 volts so it's a lot of power going to the motor as we are increasing in speed the built-in oil pump will take over and supply sufficient oil pressure to the alternator and we will then get an indication that the oil pressure is too high. Uh, sometimes we get both uh, a red indicator and a, an audible alarm. Sometimes we just get the lamp. So we only get the lamp and I will turn off the auxiliary oil pump. And now the oil pressure is uh, is uh, the, the internal oil pressure is sufficient, and uh, motor is continue to increase in speed. Uh, the target speed it would be 711.3 tons per minute. Uh, <clears throat> that will give the alternator the correct speed the alternator speed is just above 35 turns per second and with 35 turns per second we will generate a carrier wave inside the alternator of 17200 hertz or 17.2 kilohertz which is our transmission frequency so far we we are just supplying 1200 volts as the supply to the main motor is going through a set of choke coils or transductors as we call them and the choke coils will reduce the voltage from 2300 to around 1200 or 1300 volts and uh, we are seeing uh, now that the amperage is is going down more and more we are getting close to 75 amps which is our target at that point we will turn on some uh, auxiliary equipment uh, we have a 500 volt DC rectifier and we have a 125 250 volt rectifier the 500 volt rectifier will be used to saturate the choke coils and by that increasing the voltage from 1200 up to 2300 volts the 250 volt uh, rectifier would be used to uh, among other things uh, uh, act as a, uh, to, to magnetize the alternator so we can get the carrier wave so i think we are ready on okay to turn on the 125 
and the 500 volt rectifier. <coughs> So the next step now would be to engage the 500 volt, which Anoki will do. And we can notice that the voltage will increase by 1,000 volts immediately. And we can hear that the, the, the motor is revving up. Now Anoki is uh, operating a sluice gate in the start resistor. And by that, we are raising the water level inside resistor, and the resistance to the rotor will be lower and then your Oki will engage the 250 volt and now we are starting to generate a carrier wave inside the alternator and he is also raising the sluice gate in the compensation resistor Yeah. <clears throat> so now Jan Oke is adjusting the water level in the start resistor and he is looking at the voltage to the main motor which still is around 2300 volts. We want to get to around 1900, between 1900 and 2000 volts. <clears throat> which is the optimal voltage for controlling the speed of the motor. The Alexanderson uh, alternator has uh, an automatic speed control from which you can see the gauges now are reacting. And the automatic speed control system is trying to control the 500 volt to the choke coils and by that controlling the speed of the motor. We are still not out on the antenna. So before we can connect to the antenna, the automatic speed control has to be close to 17,200 hertz, which we are getting very soon. Vi sätter på fläkten så Jan Åke vill gå down and uh, turn on a cooling fan. The cooling fan is used to cool the contacts of the large contactors controlling the 500 volt. Uh, without the air cooling the contacts will uh, get damaged or possibly melt from the high arc or from the arcs from the high uh, power. Very good. Uh, Can we add a little bit more? By a little, so. So then we can connect the alternator to the high frequency amplifier. And by that, we will be connected to the antenna. We are waiting for a red lamp, which will indicate we are connected to the antenna. There we go. And then Jan Åke can push the test key. And now Jan Åke is operating an adjustable uh, uh, coil uh, to 
tune the resonance frequency of the antenna and at the same time he's monitoring the power going out to the antenna and the meter is very hard to read as it is uh, logarithmic and in, in the wrong end so 50 amps is just a very uh, very small movement of the needle so I think we are uh, quite okay at the moment Ska vi köra lite remsa? We will turn on our punch hole strip recorder YouTube live stream and I can see in the chat that uh, many of you now can hear us all over Europe. And uh, I think we can take a small walk outside the building and we can show you the uh, antenna. It is getting dark so It is a fantastic evening in Grimmelton, Sweden, today. Temperature is around 6-7 degrees centigrade. The sun is just setting and you can see the clouds in the horizon and then clear blue skies and we can see one or two stars appearing on the sky. This fantastic building was uh, uh, designed by a Swedish architect named Karl Åkerblad. He also designed several other radio station buildings in Sweden. It was erected in 1923. And now we are following the antenna wires from the building up to the first tower and then to the other six towers. So all six towers together act as one antenna. Uh, the design was made by Ernst Alexanderson, the inventor who also invented the Alexanderson alternator. Uh, this antenna at that time was extremely efficient uh, compared to McCorney who had an antenna with an efficiency of around 2%. This could produce up to 12% efficiency, which is extraordinary. Today we believe we have about 10% efficiency. Um, we are transmitting with about 80 kilowatts from the alternator, meaning that we get about 8 kilowatts out into the air. And from each tower there is a vertical radiant wire that will produce vertically polarized uh, radio waves, which is the one we need. The top net uh, is there just to distribute uh, the power from the alternator.
I think we are looking good. <coughs> we have uh, a small fluctuation of frequency. Uh, but generally, the transmitter is quite stable. We, we, we stay within plus minus 10 hertz. I would also like to introduce Per Bailund, who is our representative from World Heritage Grimmeton, and he will now say a few words. Uh, thank you, Frederick, for that introduction. Um, as, he, as he said, my name is Per Bailund, and uh, I have the honor of representing the Grimaton Radio Station uh, World Heritage Site Foundation, uh, which uh, owns and manages uh, this uh, property. Uh, today is, uh, as Frederick mentioned earlier, a very special occasion as it marks the 50th anniversary of the adoption of the Convention concerning prote the protection of the world cultural and natural uh, her heritage by the General Conference of UNESCO uh, on the 16th of November in 1972. Uh, intended to encourage the identification, protection and preservation of cultural and natural heritage around the world considered to be of outstanding value and uh, value to humanity. The World Heritage Convention, as it is more commonly referred to, changed the way we care for our common heritage. Uh, to this date, 194 state parties have ratified the convention and the associated World Heritage List has grown to include 1,154 cultural, natural and mixed properties uh, around the world. Despite the various attributes of these sites, ranging from ancient monuments to wonders of natural beauty and, yes, even a radio station, uh, possessing outstanding universal values and having met at least one out of UNESCO's ten selection criteria, serve as the common foundation for their inscription. They are, to say at the very least, uh, important symbols to us all. Uh, since the adoption of the Convention, it has become evident that the World Heritage Sites are valuable resources with much to offer. Nonetheless, there is still much to do, while the efforts and achievements of the past 50 years are no small feats. The theme of this year's celebration, the next 50, reflect the work that is still to come. Much can happen in half a century, and it is abundantly, abundantly clear that there are and will be many challenges ahead. Uh, the next 50 uh, is meant to encourage dialogue uh, to inspire new visions for the next 50 years of world heritage. Sustainability, preservation and representation in a changing world and challenging times are key aspects of this. In this light, the world heritage should be seen as a source uh, of resilience, humanity and innovation. While we can never be certain of what the future holds, we, can, we do know that we can shape it to, by working together, and together we are, as a species, capable of incredible things. Uh, I will now hand back to the Alexander Association for the uh, continued startup and eventual transmission um, of today's telegram. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Pat, for that. We are all very proud to be part of this fantastic site. Uh, now we are waiting for uh, the time to be uh, 5 o'clock uh, Central European time, or 4 o'clock UTC, when we will transmit our message. That is in four minutes from now. Send out the peace message to the world, and Kai is preparing.
Thank you very much, Kai. Excellent. Uh, that was our peace message. Uh, the message uh, has been uh, composed by Lena Sommerstad, who is chair of Swedish National Commission for UNESCO. Uh, together with World Heritage Grimmeton Radio Station and uh, the Alexander Grimmeton Association. Um, we hope that very many of you out there now have been able to receive SAQ and that you have enjoyed listening to SAQ. The last transmission from SAQ was last year on December 27th, so we are talking almost 11 months. So this is very big to us also. Uh, we very much appreciate your listener reports. Uh, even if you didn't hear us, but you tried, please send us a report. Uh, go to our website, alexander.n.se, uh, where you will find all information on how to issue a listener report. Uh, it's time for us to turn off this fantastic uh, transmitter and um, I will ask Jan Åke to uh, disconnect the knife switches for the 250 volt and the 500 volt. Um, I will go and turn off the uh, main motor. And Jan Åke, he will turn off the 500 volt rectifier, 125, 250 volt rectifier. And Jan Åke will uh, return the sluice gates in the start resistor and compensation resistor to its bottom position. And you can see now that uh, the generator slowly is revving down. Uh, it will take about nine minutes for the generator to come to a complete stop after we have uh, turned off the power. And then Yonoki will turn off the fan. And now it gets really quiet in the transmitter hall. When the machine is fully up and running, it is practically impossible to communicate. <coughs> now we have uh, uh, an alarm for low oil pressure. And Jan Åke, he will turn on the auxiliary oil pump again. So the Alexander Association has around 650 members. Uh, we would very much like to have all of you watching now uh, as our members. So uh, please join our association. It, it costs 125 Swedish kroner, about 12 euros per year. And with that money, you are helping us to keep this fantastic uh, transmitter up and running. So now it's time for us to say thank you very much to all of you who has uh, attended this video transmission and um, many of you maybe have also heard us uh, online. So once again, please send us your listener reports. They are very appreciated. 
Um, from all of us here at Grimmerton Radio Station, we would like to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. And uh, we hope to be able to be back in the air soon again. Uh, please check our websites for any, any information about upcoming transmissions. So again, uh, thank you very much and bye-bye from Grimmerton. <laughs>